think uh, this year is uh, uh, Professor Yu Yuan from University of uh, Washington. Uh, so his uh, title today is a modern, modern, modernity approach to concrete of the Hessian estimate for the Manju ampere equations. So whenever you're ready. Okay. Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, uh, Jie for the invitation. Uh, it's, yeah, I'd be happy to be here. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, a uh, Hessian estimate from uh, an integral approach for Hessian estimate, um, which was uh, done by Pagarlov. So first of all, so by the time well, Pagarlov is a, yeah, it's a it's a good brand name. I don't know how many of you seen him. So by the time I was thinking of uh, inviting him, that's around 2006 or 2007. I found he already passed away. It's really, yeah, it's really unfortunate. That's great geometer and uh, PDR. Okay, <clears throat> let's start. So we'll talk about uh, this uh, Mount Ampere equation. So you take a scalar, you take its one derivative, two derivative, which is a Hessian symmetric matrix. You take the determinant. Then um, in case that U is convex, uh, then that determinant is positive, uh, uh, positive definite. Um, then the equation is elliptic in the sense the linearized operator of that uh, Hessian equation, or well, that equation at the scalar, you take the derivative with respect to each component of that matrix and uh, entry. So then we have a new n by n matrix. If that is positive, definite, and then that means the equation itself is uh, uh, elliptic. So right away, I want to take this approach. So this Mount Ampere equation is really a potential equation for the maximum gradient graph. If you look at the gradient graph in a pseudo Euclidean space, meaning if we look at the space time, this time space and time take the equal amount of uh, dimension, we are using this uh, null coordinate, dx dy or dx dt. And uh, let's start slowly. So u itself is convex. That means its gradient or its derivative is monotone. And uh, that really means the tangential of that Lagrangian surface is space-like. That really means the induced matrix on this Lagrangian surface. Oh, it's here. Yes. Yes, so that means uh, <clears throat> uh, that uh, the induced matrix from the uh, from the pseudo Euclidean matrix space time uh, is literally that uh, Hessian of that uh, potential U flat Hessian, and the space like really means that it's positive. So we have a space like uh, uh, matrix on the Lagrangian um, graph. The, then the mean curvature of that Lagrangian surface, right, geometrically, you just take its Laplacian with respect to the induced metric. And then it's really, <clears throat> it's really, so, <clears throat> uh, let's, let me, 
I think did I get it uh, something? Right. So and uh, then you just uh, so one second. Yes. So here is not Laplace anymore. So that's why some puzzle. Yes, that's the gradient. We take the gradient of that potential, that's a cubic derivative, and that's along the tangential direction. Now you make it uh, to the normal direction, but in the space, uh, in the pseudo Euclidean case, in this, uh, uh, under this null coordinates, and uh, then the normal means when you have a tan tangent vector, so in this case, you make, you reflect about, uh, uh, with respect to the x plane, you have this normal direction. And so that's what it means by you reflect around x plane. Because determinant is constant, then the mean curvature is zero. Okay, in particular, let's look at the curve case. Curve case means uh, dimension one. One space dimension, then the mean curvature itself is just you take two derivative cubic derivative because u is potential, you take one spatial derivative, you reach the position or height function. And the uh, u double derivative is the metric, and you take square root, that's the mean curvature, right? <laughs> so in a curve, in a in the Euclidean case, so that's exactly. If you don't mind, that's exactly, you take a, a height function, and then you take a, you take a, that a one plus f squared, and then you normalize by arc length. That's the mean curvature. But, uh, right, so in particular, that's the, in the Euclidean case, the mean curvature curve, on R2, but now if we put a potential, we call that F, the height function is, is a gradient of, yeah, it's a derivative of potential U, then we reach, that's the select special Lagrangian case, well, Lagrangian in the, in the Euclidean case. Okay, not only it's a critical, uh, point of the volume or area functional. And this, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, maximum surface is also volume maximizing. And uh, <clears throat> that's, uh, here's the interesting fact, right? In that 1989 um, thesis by Milio, with at Rice, with Harvard, um, he did in that space time, or not, yes, in a space time, in space time coordinate. And independently, that in 2006, Warren, in his, uh, uh, in his uh, oral exam paper, did this uh, under this, uh, under this, uh, now coordinates. And I say it's independent of work because that year in June, there is that AMS, AMS meeting, Harvey, Rhys Harvey literally asked in a, uh, in, in a talk, asked, oh, what about the Mount Ampere equation? Can you say something about it? I said, oh, a Seattle fellow did it. But turns out to draw the equivalence, you need a rotation, yeah, change of coordinates. Okay. So here's the other background for the Monte Ampere equation. So apparently that's the potential equation for the optimal transport. Also geometrically, it's the double potential equation for the kähler einstein matrix. And surely it's the Gauss curvature equation, right? So that's the famous Gregorian. Theorem by Gauss. Or in even dimension, that's intrinsic. In odd dimension, that's extrinsic. But anyway, it's Gauss curvature. 
Okay, so that's a kind of long introduction of the equation, mont pair equation. So why we do that Hessian estimate? Why we do that uh, a, priori, uh, a priori estimate? So in particular for that Hessian. Um, I guess everybody here knows the big picture. So let me just briefly repeat. So it is really the missing link ellipticity for fully nonlinear equation in the grand shoulder scheme uh, program. So toward existence, regularity, rigidity, uh, even for that error estimate control in the numerical analysis for solutions. So as of now, everything's set but we need that ellipticity. So the shoulder program needs uniform ellipticity. The uniform ellipticity here for mont pair equation really means, okay, before I go to that quantitative explanation, so let's just look at qualitative uh, version of that ellipticity, right? So let's look at even 1D. So log function is a monotone. You take log of determinant, make it easier algebraically. So log function apparently is increasing. So increasing, or you could imagine, so log of determinant is also increasing in the matrix space. If you increase along a positive, semi-definite matrix. So that's, uh, that's, the, that's the ellipticity. So uniform ellipticity really means that the slope, increase in slope is not zero or is not infinity. It's bounded between two positive numbers. Okay. For, but already we know the determinant. Okay, so in this instance, in the log case, so it's one over lambda. That's the diagonalized uh, ellipt, uh, linearized operator. If we know each eigenvalue is bounded, given the product is one, so then the lower bound is already there. So that's uniform ellipticity. So to to get that uniform ellipticity, we all we need is the upper bound for the Hessian or for the eigenvalues. Okay, so that's uh, the uh, yeah that's the reason why we are doing upper estimates in particular for ellipticity for mont pair equation. The upper bound is enough. Um, so in other cases, it, it, it may not solve. Okay, now let me, uh, let's uh, review various arguments toward ellipticity for various equations and counterexamples. Okay, again, the first thing is the mont pair. That's the, that's what I said. Okay, <clears throat> that's the classic work by Pogorlov in early 1970s. Um, what Pogorlov did was he assumed that uh, the solution is uh, uh, zero on a convex domain. Uh, that's a nice, turns out that's a necessary condition. Uh, that also gives him a good cutoff function, that is the negative u itself. Because u is convex, you assume it's zero on the boundary, then u is negative in the domain. And uh, he made this curious combination. So that minus u is the cutoff function. You want to bound, you want to reach that uh, upper bound of the double derivative of the potential in terms of gradient and the potential. 
And then he multiplied by that exponential e to the x squared. And it's really working. And uh, you check its maximum point because at the boundary is zero. Uh, at the maximum point, you could have, uh, you could bond the double derivative. And then at the origin, the whole product is less than the maximum. At the maximum, you have con you assume control of the gradient or, or potential. And then that means the double derivative at one point is bounded by the maximum point. Maximum point, uh, uh, at the maximum point, the double derivative is in terms of first derivative and uh, zeros order derivative. So he got his question estimate. To me, it's always was working, right? Creating this combination um, is really MP problem, non-polynomial non time. Checking is just a polynomial time. It's really, for me, it's always a mystery. So I'm always wondering, is there another way of kind of natural? And turns out, so there's this integral way. Actually, before that general dimension in 2D, uh, they, uh, you do not need that strict convexity assumption or linear boundary data. And the Pagorov did in 1964. So there's a qualitative, yeah. he got a qualitative bond using Alexander of qualitative strict convexity. And uh, so that's Pagorov's uh, shot for 2D. And then, like now, by now it's seven years ago, Chen Han and all, oh, they use some involved uh, pointwise estimate and involving that uh, eigen directions of those two eigenvalues of the 2D Hessian. And uh, actually, uh, Hong Fei Guan, the two, uh, like uh, six years ago, yes. Uh, they did this, since this one is really, really, I wouldn't call it elementary, but really neat, it's really tidy. Uh, argument. You just go with this com again, another mysterious combination, and you just check it's working. And turns out this one's also working for sigma two equation. If you assume, well, they assume that uh, uh, the sigma three has a lower uh, bond minus a daily or any lower bond. So it also works if the Hessian has a lower bond, arbitrary lower bond. You could also do it. And then, so the integral way for Mangiampere equation 2D uh, has another uh, approach that is through this uh, uh, special Lagrangian formulation. That's what I did with uh, Warren, Michael Warren, 2006. And turns out so that's a sharp uh, control. Sharp means you have counterexamples saying that the linear exponential control uh, of the uh, of the Hessian in terms of the gradient is yeah it's tight. In in uh, <clears throat> in late fifties, Hans did it by compactness for two D and uh, then in two thousand seventeen with that uh, might uh, mechanical. Uh, Song Chung, uh, we did uh, uh, using another complex argument, um, but it's almost for almost convex uh, solutions to sigma two. Uh, in uh, now uh, three years ago, three yeah, three years ago, Jiao Kun Liu uh, did a partial Lorentzian transform, and he got this explicit convexity estimate and did it. Okay, so as I already alluded that uh, for slide, 
uh, you have it, uh, but it's exclusively like that's joint work with Warren, Chen, and Docker Wang. That's in general dimension. So that's for uh, 2008 work is for convex and the large phase. Uh, here is for all the critical, necessary critical and the supercritical phase. And uh, that's all because we interpret it as the minimum surface. And then it's the argument is integral. Um, and also, Cai Yan Li uh, did that, uh, wrote up that uh, compactness argument for when they, when, when in a uniform super um, critical constant phase. So then, still, I'm always wondering if, if there is a pointwise argument. Again, as I said, pointwise argument, if you are really, so to speak, creative, you create that combination, and then you check its maximum. If you could estimate it, then you're done. Um, but to do that, I could never you know, do it yet. Okay, then for the quasi-linear equation, so that is minimum surface equation, and uh, the pointwise way is really done by Nick Koreva in 1986. It's a really beautiful combination, it's working. And uh, so the integral way, that's the yeah, classic work by Bambiri, Di Giorgi, and Miranda in 1969. It's mean value inequality using Sobolev, use Jacobi inequality. And then Trudinger gave a simplification. And uh, when they did it, when three of them did it, they used that Moses, uh, that De George Moses iteration uh, to reach that mean value inequality and so on. And Trudinger just did it by. by Well, by just plugging a fundamental solution and do this yeah, potential way. <clears throat> and then what they got is really a tight, a sharp estimate. The gradient is in terms of linear, depend, exponential linear. Uh, depend, the gradient is linear exponential height, yeah, in terms of that uh, height, linear exponential. Uh, because that uh, Bob Fang had a counterexample showing that even in 2D, so that is, you cannot, you cannot go better than that. Uh, yeah, I already mentioned Bob Fang. And then this Gregory used uh, a similar compactness and uh, generalized Bob Fang's compactness estimate for 2D co-dimension one minimum surface to 2D arbitrary high co dimension minimum surface system. For that, uh, I think I'm okay in terms of time. For that maximum surface, right, in space time, you just uh, put that time as negative, and uh, then they determine the, they determine the length becomes. The volume element becomes square root of one minus gradient r. Then to make it elliptic, uh, you require the gradient is less than uh, less than one. That means space-like. If it is uh, yeah, if it's larger than one, it's another story. So then this this becomes a wave equation. So it turns out Barnick really did it. Uh, that combination. But still, he could only push it to the boundary, not the interior way, interior uh, version. Uh, so you see the similarity of Nick Korva's combination is really re it's it's from the, the origins, the Barnick, Barnick. Okay, so. Let's come back to Manja and Perry equation or even special Lagrangian equation. So for that uh, minimum surface and hyper uh, uh, maximum surface called dimension one, there's at least for minimum surface, there's no counterexample because it gives me a minimum surface. You have a bounded height, then the slope is bounded. It is not so in the uh, Lagrange high co, high co dimension case. 
That is, if you give me a minimum surface of high co dimension, if you give me bounded height, then the gradient may be, you may see a cliff. The gradient may be unbounded. So that's the counterexample by Nadashvili and Vladud in 2009. Uh, that they construct that uh, for that uh, zero phase, when the phase is zero, they construct that C113. Um, well, the trivial lay you can add for all those subcritical phase yeah, in 3D. And then with Stalker 1, we construct the C1 epsilon. So any small epsilon discuss the solution. It's the purest fact. Is there a Lipschitz counterexample, just like the, um, just like, uh, just like uh, the Mount Jampere uh, equation. So actually, Pogorov in early 70s construct his C11 minus N over 2 counterexamples. And uh, also later on, uh, Kafrali constructed Lipschitz counterexample with the variable right hand side. But anyway, so then we push it in 2009. We push it to C1 alpha. Alpha is arbitrarily small. So why, what's the point of uh, going down? Uh, all those things is saying, remember there's that uh, Urbas result. If you cross this uh, regularity wall, you are in business, you are fine, all the way good. Meaning if you are better than C1 uh, power off, you are smooth. But uh, those counterexamples shows if you are below power law, if you are Lipschitz, you cannot in improve to better than Lipschitz. Yeah, that's what I mean by all those uh, regularity wars, wars, yes. Not a single one. And for the for that maximum surface equation, there's that uh, simple, almost trivial counterexample. Uh, linear function, the gradient is one, uh, right? Then the reciprocal is infinity. It's a totally degenerate equation, the linearizing. That's a different story. Okay, so before we head to the proof of that uh, argument for that integral approach for the Hessian estimate of Mount Jampere equation. So any questions, comments? If you could do me a favor, right, I could take a little break. Sure, I've got a question. Please. Uh, do you expect that there exists a Lipschitz but non-C1 solution to the special Lagrangian equation? Yeah, I believe so, but I couldn't construct it. That's mm. what I told you, right? Because uh, uh, that's uh, Nikolai not really asked me about that. So they did. They, he asked me two things. One is, can you improve that uh, once you have W two one? Is there some improvement or some uh, reconstruct that thing? You can never do that. And then this thing uh, for the Lipschitz one, he guessed it should be okay, but I. Yeah, I don't have the example. Mm. Thank you. Okay, so here we go. Let's look at the ideas of that uh, integral argument. So the ideal case is Laplace, right? I don't want to bore you, uh, but to me, I always want to go there. You use the divergence structure and the mean value inequality, immediately you drive that uh, estimate. And uh, for the point-wise 
uh, argument for uh, Laplace equation or general linear uniform equation, that's the Bernstein technique. Uh, that's why sometimes I call that uh, Pogorov's argument combination is Bernstein, Calabi, Pogorov combination. Okay. Uh, that's that. Okay, so here's the statement, what I'm about to uh, try to approve. You have a determinant equals one, you assume U is convex, uh, you normalize it for U for a, a gradient is zero, and U itself is also zero at the origin, at a fixed point. And uh, because we are using this space time ambient space for the gradient uh, graph, so we are using no coordinates for that space time because we skip that too. So that's okay. So we have Rn cross Rn with the pseudo Euclidean metric. Now the Extrinsic distance is just x dot y. In Euclidean space, if your matrix is dx squared plus dy squared, then that's just x squared plus y squared is the distance squared. So here the distance squared is x dot y. And uh, so let, let's go slow a little bit. So the extrinsic ball is uh, x dot ux because the height y part is u gradient x. And uh, <clears throat> so on the potential side, so the height is u is potential, the space is space, is u is, is convex, this is strictly convex. And uh, then, so that's the level set of that U, tau squared. If you make that uh, co uh, that uh, yeah, relative tau squared, a small epsilon tau square, and then by, we are assuming the boundary is, uh, your yeah, convex boundary is zero, or it's constant, and then U is convex, strictly convex, and by Kafrali's level separation lemma, you, if you make that epsilon small enough, a dimensional small enough, then the level set of gamma tau would be inside that uh, the extrinsic ball, D tau. And then the statement is the following. The Haitian is bounded in terms of the gradient. And uh, the coefficient is the boundary of that uh, level set. The area of the boundary of the level set of uh, U, potential U, over the volume of that. The normalized version used by Jones Lama, you can make this guy uh, the level set of potential between after a fine transformation, make it between two balls up to a um, dimension and scaling. So that's that way. Okay, so how we do that? So step one. So we go with the monotonicity on the maximum surface. So that is, you give me any positive or non-negative super harmonic quantity, I call it Q. Super harmonic with the induced metric means Laplace of Q is less than zero. And uh, so in, in this mont case, the induced matrix, the low U, passion of U, the determinant is one, so that, uh, that Laplace simplifies to the non-divergent operator. G upper IJ, or if you wish, if you're more familiar with 
this notation that really means this the inverse of that function. Uh, if that is if it's super harmonic, and uh, then we have this in quality. So it really follows from the distance square, Laplace of distance square is 2n sharp. It's less than or equal to the gradient of distance square over that distance square, uh, half n. And turns out that 2n half n is really important. So that gives the exact, uh, that gives the exact dimension n. So where is my n? So it's, yeah, actually it's right here. Here is really means it's Euclidean ball, tau and omega n. In comparison, in the Euclidean case, the distance squared, well, we assume it's minimum surface, it's 2n. It's, and then because in Euclidean case, the induced metric on the Lagrangian or on the manifold is larger than the extrinsic distance. That's why this gradient over that is smaller. So that's our minimum surface. Step two, and then to make it work, you really have to have a vehicle, a quantitative. Otherwise, it's just, you can only go with constant one. It's working, but that's still interesting. What's that super harmonic quantitative? Turns out it's something I call it a Jacobi inequality, Jacobi quantitative. So that is, if you take something Laplace, it's strongly subharmonic in the sense it's larger than the gradient square. Uh, that is equivalent to you make it reciprocal, and uh, then that is equivalent to the Q is superharmonic. So in the Monge Ampere case, you take the log of lambda max, and then you have a better uh, epsilon, larger epsilon. If you take log determinant plus one, or determinant of identity plus the Hessian, then it's a little bit rougher. But in any case, then, so that is roughly, not roughly, it's precisely, it's the maximum eigenvalue reciprocal with the exponent adjusted is super harmonic. But that's a hell, to me, it's a hell of computations. And uh, then the last step is the divergence of Laplace. So how we conclude or how we do it, right? So because the Q is the reciprocal of the maximum eigenvalue, we turn around, we take the reciprocal, and that would give us reciprocal of Q, that give us the maximum eigenvalue for the Hessian of the solution to the Mount Ampere equation. Remember I said, if you have an upper bound, you have lower bound because the product is one, then you have uniformly, uniform ellipticity. But now reciprocal of Q at the origin, would be less than, right, you flip that uh, monotonicity inequality. So that is the Euclidean ball tau to the nth power divided by the integral of Q. Oh, yes, over that level set of the potential because the extrinsic ball includes that exponential ball level set, given that separation lemma of Kafrali under the strict convexity assumption. Okay, so here is, uh, so I found it, I was, I was really surprised, it's silly, but it's working. So here is how you make, how you move it to the Q inverse, the lambda max. You do the following, right? It's really, you, you just call something one as Q times Q inverse. 
to adjust it, it uh, q half times q negative half. That integral is gamma volume squared. And then you use Cauchy Schwartz. And then you cancel the lower integral, the integral of q, which you have no control. Okay, so then the price you pay is a, a gamma, the volume of level set squared, divide, dividing that uh, tau to the nth power. And then it's integral of the lambda max to a small power, but that's okay. The power is less than one, lambda max is larger than one. So it's less than Laplace of u. Once you have this Laplace, you're in business because it has divergence structure. You can lower the derivative to one by fundamental theorem of calculus. And then that's it. And now, <clears throat> if you know that John's lemma, and then you renormalize, and then also you know it's convex, you will see, yeah, with in a normal slice version. So that is really just one over top in that order. So that finished the proof. Okay, let me summarize. So you have a two version to the minimum surface. In the minimum surface, you have this uh, uh, increase in monotonicity formula. And uh, in the maximum surface, well, you can guess. It turns out it's also true. So where's my step one? I think I deleted. Oh, what's my step one? And uh, you have the two version of that monotonicity formula for that uh, minimum surface, which is increasing, uh, which is decreasing. And uh, then you search, you search for that super harmonic quantity. So in the minimum surface case, you look at that subharmonic quantity. And uh, then you use then you move to that uh, Laplace from that quantity of the Hessian, you move to Laplace, that's imaginable. Uh, you take advantage of the divergence of Laplace, and then you can lower the derivative by one order and reach the desired estimate. So I specifically mentioned the divergence of Laplace is like in the other rotated version, if I use space and time coordinates instead of no coordinates, then there's no corresponding divergent structure, so I couldn't do it. So that's a question I asked. So that is, for the interior gradient estimate for maximum surface equation, so if you assume it's Space like pointwise at the, at the height function level, can you derive something like uh, the gradient? Surely it's bounded. You want to estimate the gap from one because that should be less than or equal to one. The uniform ellipticity is really is the reciprocal of the gradient, one minus the gradient. And uh, yeah, I couldn't do it because I cannot pull out. So those uh, uh, monotonicity formula is right there. The super harmonic quantity is right there, but I do not have a divergence structure. That's, that's one. So another question I'm asking is uh, for that, uh, Question estimate for the complex Mangian pair equation. But we all know that 
there are tons of counterexamples. But now let's throw in a real convexity assumption. Because all the singular available singular solutions, as far as I check, they are all complex convex, but none of them is real convex. For example, that uh, when you first singular solution to the Mangan pair equation, I'll take this form, right? If the dimension is two complex dimensions, two is Lipschitz. When the dimension is three, it's just a holder, but, not, but it's not real convex. So I guess with that, I'll stop here. Okay, so thank you very much for the very nice talk. Uh, any questions? Yeah, I mean, isn't any solution of the real Mojan pair equation also a solution of the complex Mojan pair equation, making an appropriate extension oh, no, to the. That's right. Yes, it's called, uh, I call it flat toric. <laughs> okay. Toric is constant. And uh, uh, how to say that? So that's it's only it's only a, a a setting. So how to say that? Uh, how to say that? That's yeah. That, that's that kind of silly thing. Um, um, give me one second. Yeah, that's true, but it's like uh, you give me a smooth solution to real Mangan pair equation or you know, whatever. So yes, so the, the, in that case, that's true. But now here is uh, um, you ask that uh, that the general situation, yeah. the mm -hmm. genuine, not general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, sorry, I do have one yeah, more. Go ahead. Oh, sure, sure. So uh, <clears throat> for real motion pair, one can construct counter examples, which are C1 alpha for any small alpha, exactly C1 alpha. And I think for special Lagrangian equation, you mentioned you have these examples which are C1 alpha, but for a very special sequence of alpha, like one over an odd integer or something. Yes, yes, yeah, that's, yeah, I, I should, uh, no, no, actually, I, I meant to uh, brought up that comparison. Uh, so here you go. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I meant to do it. So in, so in our construction with Caproli, uh, right, it's why well, you make a rationalizing substitution solving that Cauchy Kowalewskaya. Yes, Kowalewskaya. And, uh, but then I'm always wondering can you go with those uh, irrational exponents? Mm -hmm. It turns out you did it. Right. right. Yeah, mm -hmm. like you did it. So it's, uh, uh, I assume it's also for arbitrary small exponent. Right. Right, so that's uh, so yes, so it's uh, I meant to make that comparison, but over there, right, you 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 solve the Rishi problem and so on. That's that's a good, uh, right. Uh, for this, now come back to your question. Mm -hmm. So, for over here, I I couldn't, I yeah, I thought about it, I couldn't do that because now in the Montgomery Park case, your singular solution itself could serve. Well, you chop off the uh, you chop off the regular factor, and then the singular factor alone serves a super solution. Mm -hmm. But in this uh, slack case, the special Lagrangian case, there's no such a luxury. Mm -hmm. I see. And uh, so, so. I believe 
I believe it is okay, but uh, I could never, yeah, I cannot do it. Okay, I mean, do you think it's possible that C1 alpha solutions have to satisfy that alpha is like one over an integer? The rest, I call this rational. Yeah, that's what R means rational, right? It's mm -hmm. the first letter of R. Right. Word. Word. Um, that's the technical reason, right? As I, as I already explained, uh, in this construction, you turn around, you go with, uh, because you, you start with, uh, it's, as I said, actually, actually it's more important thing is the following. So those solutions, singular solutions are, I call it analytically singular, but geometrically regular. Right, the gradient graphs are. Right, so yeah. the, as a geometric object, it's, it's just as good as you could get, it's analytic. Mm -hmm. But it's, you are using, you are in a, you are faking, you are using the wrong coordinate, singular coordinates, you make it singular. I see, I see. So, so all the counter examples or geometrically. So the more, yes. more importantly, <laughs> I'm really looking for a, a geometrically, right. genuinely geometric singular solution. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Other questions? Uh, so in your last proof, uh, is this exponent n minus one uh, optimal? Okay, that's really a subtle and yet a good question, um, but I didn't go there. So let me take this chance to go there. It's you see that. Uh, Uh, right, so here you go. So <clears throat> we could compare because I have that chart. So I have that chart, so it's... Uh, so that's the statement so that exponent so but let me answer your question first i don't know <laughs> but at least in uh, technically in terms of this argument if you could uh, find a better quantity for q uh, you will have a better expo smaller exponent for example already here provided two so one is uh, lambda max. The other, the other is determinant. Yeah, it's the product of those determinants, right? Uh, but the more important thing is a subtle thing is here. Then you see, oh, that's the Lee uh, uh, polynomial dependence. And uh, here, in my large chart, that's the uh, that's the exponential dependence. What's the difference? Also, I claim it's sharp. You can turn Bob Fenn's counterexample minimum 2D minimum surface through that, uh, what's that? Uh, yeah, transformation, hence transformation to a 2D mountain particles. The difference is here, so you assume your domain is fixed, a unit ball. And uh, in this formulation, your domain is not the unit ball in the X space, it's the level set of U. And uh, so it's a level set of U. So you normalize this way, and uh, still, yeah, it's, it's, you, are, you already normalize this between two balls. But over here, that means you already have this extra assumption. You assume 
let's let's assume it's a unit ball, but you assume u is zero on that unit ball. In that general situation, you never assume u is zero on the boundary of the unit ball. You just assume it's random. You have no a fine boundary assumption posed on the boundary. So that's why uh, still it's yeah, still it's sharp that way. It's uh, it's sharp that way. Again, to answer your question, is that n minus one exponent sharp? I don't know. Okay, thank you. Uh, if no other questions, let's thank the speaker again.